Um, let me see if we are in practice session. We have started. Yeah, I think we have started, guys. Oh, um, it's apparently live. I just received an email that uh, yes. a colleague is like seeing us and hearing us. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Great. Ah. All right. Um, so Mariana, just to let you know, I have uh, created like a list of house rules it's in the chat. If you'd like to alert everyone that they can see the information there, and then you can start. I guess that we can start and then you start with that one and then I just take over. Okay. Okay. All right. So, awesome. so uh, okay. Um, uh, apologies everyone for having started without realizing it. And thank you very much for joining. I see that uh, we have uh, a few uh, attendees already uh, online. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, just let you know, we have uh, in the chat uh, created a set of uh, house rules uh, where you can uh, uh, have uh, a look and understand how this session is going to work. Uh, in principle, just to let you know that uh, you can raise your hand in case you want to receive uh, the speech, the floor. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, the idea is uh, that you can ask your questions through the Q&A uh, functionality that you can see in your tool toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you want to use the chat, you can, but we would like to urge you to please um, ask the questions in the Q&A because it's easier for the panelists and for the presenters to monitor. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mariana uh, to give us the introduction for today. Thank you, Tonia, and thank you everyone for joining. I think it's a little bit late for some of the people that is joining, so thank you very much for the commitment and interest on the topic. Um, today we're going to talk about D5. Uh, we have a couple of experts that are going to be presented some of the reports that are right now in the space, and then we're going to discuss uh, an action that was really interesting to see because joined together and mobilized a lot of, of the industry players. So we have also Marina and Erwin and myself who are going to present a little bit how 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 was the process to organize uh, everyone around uh, the reply to actually just like mobilize and present uh, one voice for the industry. And then we're gonna go a little bit deep down on what was on the consultation that we replied and some of the conclusions and points of view that we wanted to highlight. And after that, of course, we wanted to hear from the experts. So we invited Joachim and Olivier from the European Commission. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Joachim and, Oli and Ivan from the European Commission in Olivier, which is part of the AMH, which is a national regulator as well. And we will have uh, Merab joining later as representative of the academia. Uh, we have a couple of questions for them. Uh, if you have more questions or want to intervene, as Tonya said, you can always do it uh, with the uh, Q&A functionality. We hope to have enough time for people to actually like do some of those questions and address the speakers. Uh, but I guess the conversation is going to be so interested and excited that uh, we might extend um, in the time that we are going to give to the, to the panel. And then we will have a series of conclusions conclusions that, uh, that are more like general about the DeFi ecosystem that uh, the European uh, Crypto Initiative is going to, to do for us. Just a couple of things so you know, um, we are recording the session and it's going to be online for everyone to, to take a look, review, if you need to step down at some point, it's going to be recorded for you to, 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 to take a look and know what happened after. And we are also going to produce a paper uh, with the main topics and the, 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 the take that Way and and lessons learned from from this session and we're gonna share it with the list of people that register but it's also going to be public. Um, if you have any comments, uh, we are always welcome. Uh, welcome in like comments or opinions or if you want to just like get involved with any of the associations here, just feel free to reach out to us. Without further ado, I want to ask Tonya to actually present uh, the main key points of a report that the EU both published on, uh, on the DeFi ecosystem. So, Tonia. Thank you very much, Mariana. Let me share my screen. 
Okay, let me know if you can see my screen. Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, so just to let you know, I'm, I'm working with the U-Blockchain Observatory in Forum and uh, about one year ago, we published this report on decentralized finance in order to give an overview of uh, what's going on in the space of DeFi, provide a little bit of fundamentals on understanding uh, what DeFi is, what are the main differences with traditional finance, uh, and what are the main benefits and risks included. Uh, so um, for this report, um, we had two main chapters where we made an introduction to decentralized finance. We provide some of uh, its intrinsic characteristics, uh, an overview of uh, functional differences, operational differences, and regulatory landscape differences with traditional uh, finance. We gave uh, a, a few insights on the DeFi fundamentals about the different layers of the stack, the technology stack and the uh, DeFi market size. And then on the second chapter, we discuss a little bit about DeFi um, applications. Uh, and uh, we had a set of conclusions for uh, finalizing the report. So uh, as a general uh, approach, what we did we, was to, we gave a definition of uh, DeFi as an umbrella term for a collection of financial products uh, which rely on smart contracts and blockchains to enable open peer-to-peer -peer financial services and automate specific procedures. Uh, DeFi applications aim at decentralization, although the degree to which they are decentralized vary. Uh, decentralization is uh, quantified from multiple perspectives, starting from the base layer. Uh, and the code base of the protocol and includes factors such as governance structures, voting procedures, and more. Uh, due to its open, decentralized, and P2P nature, uh, DeFi also enables money Legos, which refers to the interoperability of applications in the space, and it is often cited as one of the aspects responsible for the rapid innovation in the space. Uh, so we looked at DeFi and how it can differ from traditional finance in substan substantial ways in terms of its operation, but also as in terms of its prospects. We looked at features like access, data integrity, interoperability, settlement, and value. And we looked how in terms of access, we have permission versus permissionless models. Uh, we have uh, uh, in terms of data integrity, uh, read and write access, which is controlled and managed and exclusive in, in case of traditional finance and inclusive and immutable in the case of DeFi. Uh, in terms of interoperability, we have segmentation and dependency on multiple intermediaries, while we have composability and money Legos in the case of DeFi. In terms of settlements, we have a timely chain of events in traditional finance and immediate settlements in terms of DeFi. And in terms of value, use cases to record. And data does not record value, but is value in itself in the case of DeFi. The same goes uh, with functional differences. We look at accounting, trust, data availability, history and characteristics, user experience, risk and reversibility. Um, I don't want to go through each and every single one of them. The, the, the presentation will be shared and I can give you also a link to the report itself for you to review and look into the different uh, proposals and suggestions that uh, we make in it. Um, in terms of operational differences, again, we have custody uh, entities, access and transparency. And in terms of the regulatory landscape, which is very different because it's something that we are looking at, uh, we see that uh, as, as known, uh, DeFi is ruled by law and code uh, in, uh, in, uh, in contradiction with traditional finance, which is ruled by law. Uh, in terms of record keeping uh, in traditional DeFi, we have government by regulation and confidentiality, where DeFi is uh, openly accessible. Uh, and in terms of consumer protection, this is where attention is required because in the case of DeFi, it is quite unclear whether existing regulations apply or we need new ones to be applied. Uh, as a general perspective, the, the 
the main differences rest with ideology, infrastructure, innovation potential, and human facing aspects. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, uh, DeFi uh, makes financial services accessible to everyone in contradiction to the fact that uh, in traditional finance, uh, resources are allocated and uh, commerce is facilitated based on investment and development. In terms of infrastructure, uh, we have private versus open uh, databases. Um, in terms of innovation, uh, we see that for traditional finance, it's incremental and sustaining, while in DeFi, it's radical and disruptive. And uh, when it comes to human facing aspects, we see that we have a transition moving towards Web3 uh, with DeFi. Uh, in the report, we examine uh, the, the technology stack and we look uh, at the different layers of the technology. And at the same time, we are looking at the blockchain trilemma, uh, where uh, we look how we can have, we need to have decentralization, security, and scalability, but it's difficult to achieve all three at a time. So one of the difficulties of proving the trilemma lies in defining decentralization, security, and scalability in an objective manner. Uh, this is uh, one uh, of the key topics that we look into in this report. Uh, we furthermore, look into the DeFi market size and how it has evolved within uh, the years. And uh, the user base, which has increased significantly. And we also cover primary areas of uh, DeFi, such as stable coins, decentralized le uh, lending and borrowing, decentralized exchanges, and also uh, blockchain-based derivatives, uh, insurance options, and prediction markets. Uh, and finally, we look at concepts regarding DeFi risks, uh, inner working of decentralized exchanges, incentives, and the future of uh, DeFi. Um, the risks are um, are looked into uh, from a technical, financial, and procedural perspective, and uh, we examine how these risks uh, can be addressed. And then, uh, as conclusions, we end up uh, discussing how DeFi represents a disruptive application of blockchain-powered decentralization in financial services how it offers P2P transactions without intermediaries and trustless interactions offering new possibilities, uh, how the existing DeFi applications are just the beginning of a wave of innovation. And uh, we, at the time, had reviewed the DigiFisma report uh, on uh, DeFi, uh, where it's mentioned that DeFi can enhance security, efficiency, transparency, accessibility, openness, and interoperability compared to traditional finance. Uh, the report also suggests that there are substantial opportunities for cross-border financial integration and highlights at the same time, some very important risk factors that are mainly due to regulation as mentioned before, but also due to the pseudonymous culture. Um, we need to identify and address operational risks to make sure that we can have growth and stability for DeFi. And uh, through the report, we see that we need to improve operational risk assessment and commit more resources to it. Uh, some regulatory considerations, uh, a new regulatory framework may be needed to accommodate the unique characteristics of DeFi, smart contracts and legal enforceability, transparency and auditing benefits of public blockchains are areas that definitely need to be addressed. Uh, the regulatory framework should balance accessibility, transparency and innovation while prote protecting investors. And we see that there are a few challenges for the regulators who must adapt to the global and trustless nature of DeFi applications and services. They should look into legal protection, liability, and regulatory compliance for DeFi with consideration. Uh, they need upskilling in monitoring DeFi activities and auditing smart contracts. Uh, and then uh, we definitely need to set up a clear and favorable uh, regulatory framework uh, for Europe to thrive in the sector. 
we need to balance traditional finance with DeFi without hindering competition or innovation, which is quite challenging. Uh, and uh, we need to work with the uh, regulatory sandboxes that can facilitate collaboration between DeFi developers and regulators. And some final key points, DeFi offers digital transformation, competitiveness, and new forms of financing for SMEs and citizens. A clear regulatory framework is required to support DeFi's growth and prevent talent and innovation from moving elsewhere. This is what Europe is fighting for, to maintain its competitiveness and maintain its skill set through its people. And technologically neutral regula regulations should balance innovation, supervision, fairness, efficiency, and enforceability. And with that, I leave you. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Marina. I am gonna just like make some notes in advance. Uh, thank you, Tonia. And the reason what I wanted, like, or we wanted in designing the agenda to start with the report of the EU both is for those that are new to the sector, like this is a really good overview of what is out there. And they also build on like different reports. Um, for example, IOTA is right now working on a DeFi definition and we have been trying to review like different sets of reports. and. As Tonya mentioned, if the market is growing for DeFi, this means the interest is growing for DeFi, and we face one report coming from like regulatory bodies or academia almost on a weekly basis at this point. So what we have trying to do is actually like uh, try to analyze the different input coming from the different reports and see where we stand and what are the differences and similarities in, in different areas. Um, particularly IOTA is working on the definition. Uh, each uh, organization here is working on different areas. For example, Erwin and the European Blockchain Association work a lot with the DigiFisma on risk. And Marina and the uh, European Crypto Initiatives are top on everything in regards to smart contracts and the data act that somehow also impact DeFi as well. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, just a little bit of overview uh, for you to know what we did uh, on the consultation that actually is the one that started all of these conversations, but not the main topic of today. Uh, ACPR, which is a national uh, regulator in France, uh, published a consultation paper on DeFi uh, that brought a lot of questions and topics that the industry wanted to comment. Um, they have the door open for us to send replies. And what we did at that moment was understanding that our voice as an industry was stronger and better if we managed to put like one voice and actually agree on certain points. And what we did basically was an open call to members of different associations and communities to comment in all the questions according to their level of expertise and time, because it was quite intense. And then the leads of those organizations here, Marina, Erwin, and myself review all of the input of the associate or like uh, of the organizations and individuals that participated. We also got a lot of support from the European Blockchain Observatory by providing access to the expert panel. And we consolidated answers that not only presented one point of view, but actually like the different points of view of, of the communities in certain areas. To us. This was a really interesting exercise because it showcased that um, DeFi has like different meanings from different organizations and there is more need for alignment. But this also come uh, with the understanding that DeFi is still in early stages and there is way too much to happen and to come still for us to start to actually uh, go strong in, in certain clarifications and regulations. Uh, what was interesting also from this consultation was the openness that we have in uh, in some of the uh, European regulatory bodies and the national uh, authorities as well were really interested in talking to us and actually like hearing the voice of the industry and not only the big players, but also the startups in SMEs that sometimes are the ones that get like heavily impacted when there is uh, a strong and fixed regulatory uh, settings. That said, I'm going to hand over to Marina to actually like, introduce a little bit what was on the ACPR consultation and what were those key questions that actually motivate all of us to, to come together and, and, and present this voice. Thank you so much, Mariana. I'm just going to take a minute to share my screen um, because I have a short presentation for all of you. And the presentation is mainly about what the ACPR discussion paper was writing and what the SPR was thinking about when they were looking into how to regulate DeFi. 
So mainly what the discussion paper was about was a description of the DeFi ecosystem, its main use cases, its promises, and its limitations, of course. Uh, for example, one of the most interesting part that they were describing was um, a high level of concentration that characterizes the DeFi ecosystem and the fact that governance of its applications is sometimes highly centralized. Of course, this all constitutes risks. So the idea was to describe what a DeFi ecosystem is, what are the main use cases, but specifically also focusing on the risks because this is what, of course, we all are interested about and looking into how to manage those risks. Uh, the description of the risks uh, is the part that I just described, but also what is interesting is the schematically distinguishing the three main layers that make a blockchain, the infrastructure layer, the services application layer, and the mechanisms allowing users to access those services. And I think this is very, very nicely in a way shown here in this graphic, which we have on the first layer that is the lowest one is the infrastructure layer. Usually it is composed by nodes and it is a system on how to reach consensus on specific information that is then agreed upon in the blockchain. And those infrastructure layers are a little bit different in all different blockchains that we know today, but in a way, sometimes in different applications, they are also connected to each other. So we see on your left, um, on your right, the bridge, which the bridge is basically the one that is bridging different blockchains together. On top of it, we have smart contracts and APIs that are allowing those decentralized applications to basically function. Usually they're about lending or borrowing, buying and selling. There's also about derivatives and oracles, etc. So I would say that those are mainly the most important DeFi applications that we know today. Of course, they are connected somehow if or um, for sure with the infrastructure layer, with the centralized applications that you see on your left. Those are centralized exchanges, centralized oracles, and other centralized applications, which are mainly accessed through wallets that we call hosted wallets. So wallets that are hosted by centralized applications, which is not the case for DeFi, where those wallets are usually unhosted or just wallets that everyone uh, as a user is in uh, in pos a possession of, and they are the sole uh, person that can access those wallets and the applications that um, are entered by those wallets. And on top of it is basically the interface, which is the website that you can access those applications through. There could be multiple uh, websites for one specific application, or sometimes, um, of course, those interfaces are not needed if the user is knowledgeable enough to enter through the backend without using the interfaces. So it's pretty complicated, but I think that um, this is a very, very nice description of how DeFi works. And of course, all those layers and all those applications are very important for us to understand where the risks are and of course, how to regulate DeFi. The main idea of the ACPR discussion paper is the regulation of DeFi cannot replicate the system that we have today for decentralized finance or just finance as we know it, uh, but it is done governed in a different way. And so this is why also the regulation for DeFi should be done in a different way. The regulators must take, must take into account the specific features of DeFi and those are also described in the paper. For example, regulation should be conceived as a combination between traditional finance regulations and regulations inspired by other economic sectors. The paper describes some of the options of how to regulate DeFi, and I'm going to go through just some of them, describing it very briefly. But if, of course, you're interested in it, please read the paper. It is very, very interesting. So first one is assigning a legal status to DAOs which would in a way necessary allow supervision. The second one is straightening the control framework for users access and for the supervision of intermediaries facilitating users access to DeFi services. So in this way, the users would be the one that would be, um, I would say 
yeah, facilitated or would be looked into how to how to uh, facilitate something that would be safe for users to use. The third one is supervising intermediaries to ensure that the users are adequately informed of the risks they are taking. This is very important because sometimes there is not enough information. We see that mainly the code speaks, uh, not to words as much we are used in other applications. So using and sharing enough information with the users is, is a very important feature. The next one is straightening the security of blockchain infrastructure. So the lowest layer from the, from the graph you, sa you saw before, the infrastructure war would continue to rely on public blockchains, but in this case, the blockchains would need to be certified in a way according to minimum security standards. So this is something that I, I think it's one of the first ideas that we have at least publicly heard about, and we have written a, a, a lot of um, great ideas on how to um, do that or how not to really interfere that strongly within the infrastructure layer, but this is what Erwin is going to talk about after my presentation. And the second idea is to financial uh, functions in a way through the DeFi would be transferred to a private blockchain. So these functions would then be managed by trusted private or public players. The, this is also a very important aspect, which means that in a way, if we would accept this part, only private blockchains would be, uh, would be the ones that would, would be able to transfer or would be able to use some functions in, um, in the DeFi ecosystem. The next idea on how to regulate, regulate DeFi is straightening the securities of smart contract using a certification mechanism covering securities of the computer code, nature of the provided services, and the governance on how to basically design smart contracts. And the last one is the improved framework for the provision of services and user access to those services. Players, in this case, exercise effective control over sensitive services, and those could be required to incorporate becoming subject to supervision. Players are exercising effective control over services, and those could directly fall into the scope of the supervision. So all these ideas, um, I think, are very interesting. And uh, going back to what is DeFi and going back to what is the DeFi definition, I think it's also very important to stress those four, four elements that the DeFi paper described about DeFi. First one is an, the DeFi is an architecture based on public blockchain. The second one is the protocols are based on smart contracts. Third one that DeFi usually uses decentralized governance and there is an absence of a custodian. So non-custodial wallets are used to access those applications. Of course, um, those um, are in a way the most important elements, but we are also looking into what are the main use cases. And the paper describes those um, use, use cases as the most important ones. For example, collateralized lending, token swaps, staking protocols and liquidity staking protocols, yield farming or liquidity mining protocols, flash loans, derivatives, even crowdfunding protocols, et cetera. There's a lot of them. And I think that also the description in the paper, it's quite useful. So again, very much inviting everyone to read the paper. And the most important part is of course, how to describe the risks in at the same time, the opportunities. And those are, um, mostly around admin keys and governance mechanisms. So how to support the safe use of admin keys and how to support the safe and transparent governance mechanisms when they're used in DeFi. The second ones are bugs and protocol changes. So we heard a lot of, um, a lot of times bugs uh, are happening and those, I would say, innov innovative protocols are still new. Um, there's a lot of use cases and there are a lot of, I would say, self-regulation that is happening in the ecosystem. And they are already doing audits and using best cases and uh, in a way, best opportunities to mitigate those risks. 
but they are still present. Uh, then the important ones are the systemic risks. And those are, I would say, the most important because it's so hard to determine. And I would say that even when we think about systemic risks, a lot of players in the ecosystem would need to collaborate in order to mitigate those risks. The last ones are gas fees and network congestions. We know that we are dealing with quite a lot of different blockchains layer ones at the moment, and some and um, also have those problems. And I would say all the different blockchains are trying to solve the same the same uh, problem or trying to give the same solution to their users, but all of them are valid uh, in a way on how they are solving these problems. So this is very briefly about a DeFi report of the uh, ACPR DeFi report. And I'm giving now the floor to Erwin, which is going to tell us a little bit more on how we responded to all those very valid questions. Thank you very much for that, um, Marina and Mariana. Indeed, we went through uh, a gamut of different replies, I would say. I mean, there was 30, 38 total questions that we had to answer as, um, as a cohesive body. Um, and these basically broke across five, let's say five main points. Uh, the first one is, as Mariana had already mentioned, was the need for, first of all, arriving at a coherent and consistent definition of what decentralized finance actually is with regards to how you use the, uh, the definitions for example, what the ACPR discussed in terms of disintermediated versus decentralized and how both of those in the event would constitute some form of distribution of or control of decision making that differ um, in the removal and in and the introduction of those intermediaries um, and how that's achieved through different technological advances. So um, we argued that uh, DeFi could be considered depending on the constitution and the composability as either decentralized or uh, and or dis in disintermediated um, as the blockchain technology uh, al allows it with the utilization of those smart contracts which enable both both of those concepts. Uh, the second one, and this is more of let's say um, ontologically philosophical, is that DeFi is by and large a democratizing force in finance. Um, so we stress that the development of DeFi has the potential to democratize financial services, facilitate financial inclusion, and significantly has the power to evolve and play a crucial role in how the digital economy, specifically also within Europe, will, will move forward. Um, DeFi faces challenges um, in terms of centralization, concentration of power, cyber attacks. Uh, there's, spe there's specific endogenous risks that are related to things like the, uh, the information asymmetries due to pseudonymity, the price liquidity feedback loops, over collateralization risk, and things of this nature. However, um, we also put forward the idea that um, liquid democracy, quadratic voting, DAOs, futarchy, these are examples of, of um, uh, technological and governance abstractions that can be used to mitigate those, those intrinsic risks. And in our reply, we also stress that both layer one and layer two solutions um, should be compared with regards to how to address both the uh, scalability and the security issues. Uh, one major point in the ACPR reply was obviously this, this point around, um, around certification of smart contracts. Um, we don't argue against the certification of smart contracts. We argue that, that smart contracts should be robust. Um, we argue for auditing. We argue for uh, the need to include these tools as, um, as a complement rather than viewing certification on a spectrum of prohibition which um, you could interpret part of the paper uh, that the ACPR proposed um, attempted to do. Um, but we also argue that certifying a loan might not be sufficient and that the need for, for example, more efficient bug bounty programs, continuous monitoring and regular security audits as is expected of software that obviously deals with, with, uh, with financial services should also be part and parcel with the ongoing safety and security of those smart contracts. And uh, then we talk about the need for, for um, proportionality when it comes to, to regulatory changes. So essentially anything that has to do with recentralization of crypto assets would indelibly pose a risk to security, reliability, trust, and governance. Um, with that being said, there are um, elements of Mika that seek to address um, at least a part of the industry with regards to those specific risks. And you could make the argument um, that a lot of this existing technology is, is already capable of enabling compliance for DeFi and for DAOs. 
for example, by restricting access to DApps using digital identities, which are extremely important, specifically when you look at the need for uh, cross onboarding services between Web 2 and Web 3 standards. So um, you can think of identity as Europe's story to tell in this regard. We have, we have um, also with regards to the, the uh, re revisions, hopefully also in the future of the, of the EIDAS framework, uh, the ability to embed these uh, identity regulatory standards to overcome some of the information asymmetries, obviously that have to do with the crossover risks. And then we obviously argue in, in proportion, we argue for uh, the principle of proportionality and suggest that any regulatory measures obviously need to balance innovation and consumer protection and not to uh, push in the direction of excessive uh, restrictions from impacting the development of the blockchain uh, uh, industry and solutions. And then we also speak about uh, the need to regulate intermediary services. So highlighting that essentially DeFi intermediaries um, could play a crucial role in, they do play a crucial role in facilitating access to the DeFi ecosystem. So we argue that um, a one size fits all approach regarding the way you regulate intermediaries is probably not appropriate due to the diverse range of factors, the use cases that actually govern the way that these intermediaries enact with the DeFi ecosystem in general, uh, so that those regulatory efforts should focus on the higher level, higher levels of the DeFi infrastructure, um, where most users engage with the platform, um, which would allow you to provide a more accurate balance between um, uh, consumer protection and maintaining those principles of decentralization, of cyber resilience, security, uh, innovation, and things that are inherent to the ethos of of the blockchain ecosystem. And I just want to also make a brief point regarding the um, the concept of information asymmetries, because I think this is really important from, from a perspective of when you're looking at, uh, Mariana had also mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit more about risk. So um, when you look at smart contracts, they only need publicly verifiable and accessible information uh, at the time of, insta of, of, of execution to essentially instantiate a product or service, right? So this pseudonymity and on-chain transparency, that's what lets DeFi markets basically efficiently allocate liquidity, uh, issue novel products like flash loans and, and other forms of lending. But the combination of incomplete information and the ledger transparency essentially makes decentralized finance directly bounded to those information structures that are, uh, that are possible through smart contracts. So, um, these information frictions, they exist at different levels. They exist between borrowers and lenders, which then makes under-collateralized lending impossible. Um, and then more importantly, the, the market outcome in a given period um, often depends on the agent's expectations of the market outcome in future periods. So higher price expectations equal more lending and higher prices in that period and so forth and so forth. So this, this smart contract rigidity um, makes the DeFi lending and asset prices move positively correlated with, with, with market sentiment which then also carries further rehypothecation risk. And I think that the main thing when considering risk from, from a practical perspective is to also understand that in, in, in the one hand, the, the append only nature of blockchain protocols, especially with regards to the composability that's available within DeFi needs to be tapered with a means of achieving, and I mentioned identity, but it really is this idea of, of on-chain transpa on transpa on transparency that can bridge Web2 and Web3 standards to overcome those risks. And um, if there was a takeaway, at least for, for me, from the ACTR consultation and from this work uh, with the other associations, is this idea that we as an industry have also matured um, much since, since the early iterations of DeFi. And, and we understand that it, it is, uh, we understand its nascency and we understand its imperfections to the point where we're, we're openly encouraging for this dialogue on smarter regulation, where we understand the risks, we wanna bring the risks to the attention of regulators, but all the proposals that we've garnered from this have been in a way that would make these um, regulatory, let's say developments uh, measured, tapered and, and proportionate also to the risk given the size and the TVL of DeFi relative to the rest of the financial system. Um, so that we don't speak about this in terms of systemic spillover at the level of an 08 crash, when we're talking about an ecosystem that is still quite incubated, quite cloistered, um, and that is still growing and maturing over time. So I think that this, the zeitgeist of where DeFi is really also needs to be uh, square in the mind when it comes to uh, future policy considerations. Thank you, Erwin. I just like to jump in there. I think that that was one of the points that we actually like tried to kind of like mentioned a couple of times the proportionality principle, but I'll also 
the fact that DeFi was not let out of Mika by mistake, that this was a conscious decision of the regulator because of the stage of development and the potential of DeFi uh, and how we actually need to protect the, the industry for the potential itself from the, from the European economy. So with that remark, I actually wanted to hand over to Tonia so we can start the round table with the different regulators and actually like go a little bit deep down on, on, on these easy questions. Thank you, Mariana. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, our colleagues that have joined today to discuss a little bit more in depth about DeFi. Uh, I will just mention the name and the affiliation and I will ask each of you to make an introduction of yourself. So we have uh, Ivan Keller from DigiFisma, uh, Joachim Zverin from DigiGrow, Merab Ozer from Cornell University, Olivier Boussin from AMF EU CI. I apologize, I apologize if I mispronounced your names. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Merab if she would like to take the floor and introduce herself and then each of the colleagues uh, to take the floor and uh, give us a brief uh, intro before we go on into the discussion. Thank you, Tonya, for introducing us and me specifically, and you pronounce it perfectly, so no worries. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Dr. Marav Zier, and I, uh, um, I'm a, a leading expert, global leading expert on emerging technologies, emerging technologies in general, which is Web3, AI, generative AI, metaverse, all of those. And they're definitely integrated and uh, together. And I teach about that. I develop courses for Cornell University and also at Wake Forest University uh, on emerging technologies, specifically on all of these technologies, just to, to, which I just mentioned, uh, and how to integrate and implement them um, appropriately. I have um, a PhD from Stern Business School at NYU. Uh, I live in New York City, and uh, I'm also in the process of writing a book now on emerging technologies. I, it takes a 360 degree um, approach to all the all the issues that relates to all emerging technologies, not just the benefit and how it is great and how it can uh, be applied, but also on all the issues that we just mentioned, a few of them right here, which is the risks and the ethical issues and all kinds of other things and how to implement them correctly. I look at it. I like to think about that. It would be um, an, uh, expanding how to innovate while making a uh, social impact. So um, hopefully we'll be out soon. And if you want to learn more about me, you can check out my website which is drblockchain.io, Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, blockchain.io. And you can find all my publications over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Joachim, if you'd like, please take the floor. Thank you so much, Tonya. And thanks for everyone who has spoken before me. Uh, fantastic to see so many experts, partners, friends here coming together to discuss this really important topic. Um, my name is Joachim Schwerin, Principal Economist in DG Grow in the unit that is responsible for the digital transformation of industry. In DG Grow, I'm responsible for developing the token economy in Europe for industry and SMEs. I've been working for 22 years now in the Commission on Industrial Policy, Competition Policy, then the whole pipeline starting uh, through access to finance from the financial crisis, crowdfunding, fintech, blockchain, crypto, whatever. And now since uh, two years in this field um, here, and I add to the discussion, not only the focus on finance that is probably better being presented by my esteemed colleague, Ivan, but I also look into the use cases and also discuss things like DAOs, but also the notion of decentralization as such, which is very important to us. Bottom line is we take an extremely opportunity-driven uh, approach and I have a couple of things to say on this, but uh, that I will do in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ivan, then if you'd like, yeah, sure. Um, how can I say no? So I'm uh, I'm Ivan. Um, I work in our DigiFisma, so the digital finance unit that that deals with well, you know, digital technologies in in, in finance, as the name says. Um, and I recently switched to the unit, so my background is a bit more kind of traditional finance. Uh, so for the last five years, I've been working in our 
uh, securities markets unit. So it's more kind of traditional MIFID, uh, prospectus, market abuse regulation, if, if people are familiar with those acronyms. Um, and now I work on our blockchain related files. So um, we have Mika, we have DLT Pilot, um, and obviously within Mika, DeFi is also a topic of interest. Great to be here. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, Olivier. Hi, hi. Thank you very much, Tonya. Thank you very much to everyone for organizing this. Uh, so hi, guys. Hi, everyone. My name is Olivier Beauchamp, uh, and I'm uh, just one quick cor correction, and uh, I'm just representing the AMF today. I'm actually not part of the EUCI, so just one minor uh, point to note there. Um, but uh, I'm part of uh, what you might call the innovation and digital finance team uh, at the Autorité des Marchés Financiers, which is the French, the other French regulator. We're not the ACPR, but the ACPR is obviously our uh, sister entity in France. And, and you know, very quick on that, uh, the distinction is really that they are more the prudential, uh, looking at the prudential side of things, similar to what the EBA might do at a, an EU level. And, and sort of, if I can make that comparison, we're more so on the conduct side or market side of things, so similar to what ESMA might be doing at a, an EU level, but for, for, for France, obviously. Uh, my experience, uh, well, today, I, as mentioned, I look uh, mostly at innovation uh, themes, and obviously DeFi is a big subject, uh, uh, as, as Ivan mentioned, uh, particularly in relation to, to Mika and, and how it excludes it. Uh, so obviously, uh, very interested in the discussion there. Uh, and prior to sort of being in more of this policy role, I was uh, in supervision uh, in uh, different regions and in the Middle East and previously in the UK. Uh, and I was looking at uh, digital finance players or crypto asset players amongst other things. But uh, very happy to be here today and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, I will just start with uh, the first question and anyone who feels like it can take the floor. Uh, this is a, a discussion, it's not just about answering questions so you know take the floor as you feel like it uh, so uh, one of the key points that would like to address today is the different challenges and opportunities you see in the future of DeFi taking into account uh, the hurdles that we have at uh, regulatory level and uh, how do you expect that this could be overcome do you see that there are any um, potential solutions in the regulatory uh, scene that can settle this. Maybe if you allow me just to kick up briefly and I will be very short. Um, I find that question with all due respect slightly interesting uh, because in my perspective, regulation comes last. And I think that what the commission has been doing over the past is exactly expressing this attitude. We have taken a lot of time and that started actually since the financial crisis when we're looking into crowdfunding that was the first decentralized approach towards finance that was not extremely important in terms of market size as such but it completely changed the mindset on policy making and regulation from top down to bottom up there we took 10 years to come with the regulation on Mika, people can say that we were fast, yes but if you speak to the people behind that colleagues of Ivan like Peter Kersens and other I was being involved at the time. Um, we had the basics of Mika ready in 2018, and it's a myth that everything came with Libra because we addressed the ICO issues and then later on the stable coins came on top, but we waited for the right moment. So basically, this is a learning experience which takes time and where we see that the basics is the opportunity-driven space and not primarily to see is regulation uh, the solution. Regulation with all due respect very often is the problem. We have two things here. One thing is that uh, we have an established system of regulation. So it's extremely important that we address that because in a way, nothing is technology neutral. We have in the past uh, developed regulation for the technologies that were in place. And that meant that we had to update it. And I'm very grateful to the colleagues in FISMA Connect and everyone else involved to do that including with Mika, which is uh, a regulation, as we all know, below MIFID and as I think a very, very good piece of regulation as an enabler. But that is basically addressing a quite narrow space because we had to address it for the existing regulation. DeFi, in my opinion, is something that addresses the true nature of blockchain as a movement, as a philosophy, as something that is very much fundamental in addressing the democratization of market. And therefore I was very happy about the presentation so far 
that also included DAOs, um, for example. In my opinion, and I'm just launching a study on uh, DAOs in the next couple of uh, months, indeed, it's a very good idea to discuss the legal status in Europe of these things, but then a true legal status. And we cannot discuss DeFi or DAOs or anything decentralized without horizontal principles. So to have the illusion, and that's not coming from the commission as far as I know, to have the illusion of having one regulation that addresses DeFi and then it's settled and done is not only wrong, it's a disaster. Because at the end of the day, what we have to talk here is also fundamental rules in civil law. We have to discuss liability in a very broad perspective. We have to discuss the real economy applications, of course, also the financial applications as such. And therefore, this is very much a moving target, which is why it's absolutely excellent that in the gap between having now finalized Mika and having next year, the new European Parliament and new commission coming up with a new work program gives us the perfect opportunity to bring industry and us together here in this room, but also in the following uh, discussion to address this issue. But this will never be, even if it is on a work program, one regulation. It will rather be a lot of initiatives that have a very different nature and that allow us to approach the issues. The issues are so fundamentally different from what we have seen in the past that indeed it merits, I would say, a long-term perspective to see how we can really deal with that, but not one piece of regulation. That's what I just wanted to uh, say from the outset. Um, and um, very interested to see what the others say on that. But I think let's not focus on one regulation. Um, thank you for uh, your points. I mean, um, I agree with you. Um, I'm coming from, I would like to talk from the perspective of uh, the other continent, the US, which is completely different than what's happening in the in Europe. In fact, I uh, I salute and admire, you know, Europe that at least they're taking uh, a proactive approach and trying to figure out what are the regulations and trying to come up with some discussion with the industry, like what uh, the, um, the ACPR just, just did recently, which is, I think it, it's, a, it's, it's a great step. At least, at least they're trying to communicate and trying to come up to, with some kind of a solution. I don't know if it's the best solution. Mika, people will say good or bad, but at least it tries to resolve a few uh, questions. Something that I unfortunately do not see in the US, and you probably heard about the enforcement that are happening with the SEC, going after all sorts of exchanges uh, lately, and, and uh, so, uh, all the losses that we, we have heard. We don't have a clear regu regulatory framework in the US. And I think even the report that uh, came out from uh, uh, the administration about uh, sometimes in, in November, I just mentioned that, you know, there's no clear uh, uh, framework. And this is why everything is so uh, ambiguous and unclear, and people just really don't know what to do. Uh, and there were hearings in the Congress. Now, the Congress I have, have had a meeting with, a, in fact, with a, with a subcommittee uh, of the on innovation and technology, and they tried to take an approach of, you know, kind of like take it away from regulators like the SEC and try, you know, to come up with some kind of a legislative solution. And they they are more open for uh, for this um, technology. Uh, I think the approach of the SEC, I wrote an article about that, uh, might be a bit stifling, especially you know, if, if, if Gensler, I don't know if you heard him saying that he thinks that they, you know, everything is, is uh, securities, including DeFi. And if that's the case, then we are really in trouble. Uh, who are you going to regulate exactly? Uh, the developers? Uh, what exactly is he talking about? I mean, that's completely going to stifle innovation. And I just don't even know what he means by everything is security, including DeFi. It uh, doesn't make sense to me. And I'm, I'm uh, very uh, uh, concerned, to be honest, you know, with what's happening in the US. And I, this is a global community. It goes from continent to continent. And I'm, and I'm glad that at least the EU is trying to come up with a solution, because maybe if the US sees the solutions that the, the EU is coming up with, then maybe they will start, you know, approaching it in a more sensible way. Uh, just, you know, to show you that we are in a global ecosystem, it can it basically really cross borders. That's what decentralization is all about. So it, it's kind of um, 
I, I see that, you know, that kind of uh, the economy and fragmentation of regulation that's happening from country to country might be um, a, a, a hinder to, uh, to this innovation. And that's a little bit of my concerns. That's, that's my, my take on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone, anyone else? Ivan? Yeah, maybe I can come in. Uh, I mean, just re with regards to this kind of difference in approaches between the US and, and the EU, I don't know, I, I think it, in a way we're kind of lucky in the EU where we don't actually have on, on, on a European level kind of like a, a common definition of what a security is. They do have that uh, in the States where they have this kind of functional definition. You have uh, case law, which is uh, the famous Howey test, and then they kind of um, you know, have these different criteria against which they assess whether something assess whether something is security or not, and you know that is obviously being now kind of widely interpreted by the SEC. Um, we have kind of national definitions uh, what security is. I think that was also you know, it wasn't the reason, but it was you know one of the reasons why we kind of went ahead and said, okay, let's do something at EU level so we don't have that kind of fragmentation across member states in the understanding, you know, you know what is, uh, you know, whether a certain token is in Germany a security and in France it wouldn't be. Um, so, you know, Mika was also report, uh, uh, partly born out of that, like, like many EU legislations, you know, it was an attempt to kind of prevent fragmentation. And I think, you know, that that's really good. Another thing that's I think is really useful with Mika is that it kind of recognizes the the state of affairs um, uh, in the sense that a lot of these yes uh, I, I would agree with Joachim I mean it um, it doesn't go to the core of you know from what this kind of movement was born out of which is like this you know smart contracts operating on permissionless blockchains uh, but I think it does uh, nonetheless you know do a good job of, of regulating a significant part of the market which is uh, basically an entry point for a lot of the consumers into um, into crypto including DeFi and I think it it's also useful that it doesn't that it's basically agnostic about this whole kind of post trading infrastructure that that you rely on which is basically the permissionless blockchain so um, it, you know, in that sense, I see, and these are my personal views, I see a difficulty with the approach in the US where, you know, at one point, you know, they, they might need to say, well, you know, also settlement is a regulated activity and, you know, you need to come in and register as, um, as a security settlement system or, or a clearinghouse if you're doing that. Whereas, you know, it seems like this is completely inappropriate for a permissionless blockchain. Um, so we'll see, but I mean, luckily we have international fora and, uh, you know, like the FSB, like Yosco, like, um, you know, different standard setters, uh, where, you know, I'm sure at the end of the day, we will have convergence and we should also not forget that, um, I mean, we will have this question of distinction between a Mika asset and, and, and what is a security still in Europe. And, uh, you know, the, the regulators will have to engage in that kind of balancing act to see on a case by case, case basis when looking at some of these tokens, whether it's a financial instrument or, or, or whether it's a Mika instrument. And, you know, we've, we've seen that with some of these tokens, it's not easy. You know, you have an exchange token like the FTT that was issued by FTX, you know, which is kind of indirectly linked to the profits of FTX. Um, you know, that, that starts kind of looking like a security. So I, I'm sure the regulators will, 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 will have a daunting task in front of them. Uh, but in terms of, I mean, challenges with DeFi, maybe to go back to the original question, I mean, I don't know, there, there's lots of them, I would say. I don't even know where to start. I mean, it's it's an insanely interesting ecosystem. But I mean, I think for policymakers and regulators, uh, you know, this, this, this notion that anyone can just permissionlessly plug in and anonymously transact is, uh, you know, is, is worrying, especially for people, you know, who work on types of legislation like AML or, you know, or, or sanctions. Um, yeah, th this is obviously problematic. So I think like one of the one of the challenges, and I kind of percent agree with this on Irvin, is uh, kind of sorting out this on-chain identity somehow. Um, and you know, again, I agree with Joachim. I mean, probably these kind of things will not come from the kind of financial side of things, rather than you know legislation like um, uh, EU uh, which, which kind of talk about these self-sovereign. Um, identity that you can have, you know, including in, in, in DLT from what I understand. So I think, you know, solving that is probably going to be one of the issues. I mean, increasing overall security on blockchain as well, super important. And, and, and we've heard ACPR talk about, you know, what are the possible mitigants? 
Um, and that, for regulators, I mean, I think our, or policymakers, I think our biggest challenge is going to be to assign regulatory obligations appropriately, basically. I mean, it's uh, it's not a straightforward task. I mean, when you know, the, the deeper you kind of look at this ecosystem, um, obviously there's always kind of cent centralizing, you know, elements in that. And ultimately it is humans behind, you know, these protocols. But, you know, where do you kind of, say you know this is appropriate these are the kind of obligations that are appropriate for an interface these are the kind of obligations that are appropriate for a protocol and you know this is what a casp uh, or some kind of a gatekeeper that provides access to these asps uh, to these apps should um should shoulder that's that's a difficult balancing act if we want to preserve this precisely this innovation potential so i'll, I'll maybe leave it at that thank you Olivia. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to jump in. A really interesting points, and and actually, I I I'd echo a lot of those as well. Um, especially, I think, uh, from from the perspective of the regulator, I guess, or, or a regulator, um, it's you know, like DeFi presents a lot of new aspects. Uh, I think is is you know, uh, if you adopt an observation based approach, and and I think that's that's very true uh, from what I've seen in in the EU and and in France. Um, that's the approach. You know, when there's something new. Uh, is is you, it's almost scientific, right? You start by looking at it that way, and then the other question from a regulatory perspective or legislative perspective first is how do you then act upon that or deal with it? So I think I think what I would say is that DeFi is obviously very recently emerged. I mean, in the in the you know the timeline of uh, financial activities, if you see it from that angle, uh, but it's also very rapidly evolving, right? So in terms of the different activities and products, there's still some new functionalities which are being added, or or there's always evolving matters. Uh, new types of sort of protocols, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one key question that I see is how do you balance out that you know development of innovation and, and at what point in time do you say, okay, you know, when can you start thinking about having legislative or regulatory implementation? So I think that's maybe one challenge I would say uh, in that sort of rapidly evolving uh, landscape. Um, and, and sort of within those parameters, I think, and, and again, echoing what's what's been said before, the baseline challenge I think is to understand for regulators. For you know, seeing from, and, and and you know, when I was supervising before, it was all about the activity and the licensing. So it's really to understand how you can identify the activity, if any, or the products and and any parties potentially. And this is you know where the discussion uh, gets interesting because uh, in DeFi that could be different as well. So where are the parties that might be responsible for offering these things. So I think. In some respects, this is why it's interesting because DeFi is a very different beast. Well, very, but it is a different beast because it's built off a technological infrastructure stack. So you have applications, smart contracts, protocols, underlying blockchains like layer ones, twos, et cetera. And so the difficulty is to understand for regulators, I think, and legislators where and at what level those different aspects you can capture. Um, and, and, you know, then there's a question as to whether that technology is neutral because regulators, you know, we often like to say, to say that uh, we're technology agnostic, but I think there's definitely, again, some of those new aspects that you have to consider or take into account um, and, and identify potentially where those touch points around the activity or product might be. So I think all in all, the, the, the question is, how do you develop that approach? There's also in the meantime, because, you know, there's that point in time as to when you develop or implement legislation, but there's also the question as to how DeFi might adapt to those things. You know, um, you've heard people talk about, you know, like you have some good actors out there who are trying to to sort of uh, you know uh, implement new ways of doing things uh, so alongside innovation is how do you have that sort of better disclosure uh, better transparency maybe in terms of the models um you know because at the end of the day you have users and investors um which you know uh, like those things will have to be addressed right so i think obviously the regulatory framework if any will look to address those things but that's sort of the the aspects uh, i think the the main key aspects of what what you know the challenges might be over the next couple the next couple of years. If I might just say one yes. more thing. Um, yes. um, I know that you all come from Europe and I'm probably the only one who's from the US, but uh, because of that, you know, because I work with Europe and also here in the US, I can see the differences. And I also understand I'm a great believer in this uh, technology, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, and I do believe in the potential of, of DeFi now. We all understand, you know, this technology is cross-border. I mean, that's by by, by construction. Uh, yes, there are some centralizations in it, but, but the whole idea is that you, 
there, there's no there's not a restriction exactly for for DeFi. You know, you can't say, oh, I have this, this exchange it's here in London, and therefore it's under the restriction of London. You can't say that about DeFi, and that's a problem. And the fact that we're going to doing regulation country by country and continent by continent is kind of like contradictory to the existence and the proliferation of DeFi. So I would just like to throw something out there and maybe we should try to advocate for some kind of uh, global legislation, regulation in, in for, for, for DeFi and this application, because otherwise that's by itself is going to stifle and be a, a very big challenge for, for this uh, um, uh, innovations, you know, to, to flourish uh, and, and for users to, to use them seamlessly. Uh, not to mention that uh, it will create all kinds of what we call jurisdiction regulation arbitrage, which we see already. Uh, so I'm just you know, throwing it out there as a, as, as a thought that I don't know if that's the right form or there's a different form to, to think about it. That, that, that's a thought. I mean, maybe if I can just add to that, I mean, I think this, you know, the, the fact that these markets are borderless and cross border, I, I think it's, it's in the minds of every regulator that I've spoken to and every kind of international fora um, that I've you know participated or heard people participate in. So, I mean, there's little doubt that, you know, the, the, there will be coordination at this international level. Um, and, and also, I don't think that anyone, you know, in the foreseeable future, but that's just my impression, will come out you know, guns blazing with regulation on this, uh, just because, um, you know, I think everyone kind of realizes uh, that, you know, the size of the market and, and the state of the sta uh, stage of its development is not such to warrant uh, that kind of, um, that kind of reg reg regulation. But I think you're, you're still, it, it probably will be unavoidable that, that you have, you know, different jurisdictions going ahead with different kind of you know, potentially maybe even soft regimes to kind of encourage also um, ultimately developers or uh, your or the capital behind them to come and experiment in in a more kind of legally robust environment, which I think is good. You know, because it encourages this exchange between regulators and 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 the people who are building things. Um, you know, to kind of inform lessons learned going forward. Thank you. So um, practically my my next question is part of what you have answered in terms of, uh, you know, uh, being a, a, an actual challenge, uh, how we can strike a balance between innovation and uh, the regulatory compliance in the DeFi space. Uh, so this is something that I assume is currently a challenge, but I don't know if you would like to further elaborate on that. And uh, I don't know if you if you have any further opinions, Joachim. I mean, um, I can basically subscribe to every word that has been said here. And I think if there's a message to the outside world, not only from this discussion here, is that also, and I fully mirror what, what, what Ivan has said, and also, of course, the other uh, panelists we very clearly understand where we are, what the challenges are. We understand the technology, we understand the issues. And I think there's a very serious discussion going on where no one is wanting to jump to conclusions. Um, what I find extremely helpful in such a fast moving environment is that perhaps contrary to things that have been done in the past, and I'm not talking about Mika, I'm talking about the ancient past, uh, is that really industry takes a much more active role. And with industry, I mean really those players that are DeFi and not those that are fake DeFi or that come from other interests. The same, a little bit the same discussion that we're now having about Web3 with two different notions about Web3 and no credibility by big tech uh, companies moving into Web3 and uh, putting their ideas, I would say, on our minds. This is a long-term thing. And one question that I would like to take out answering uh, Tonya, what you just said is basically the notion of decentralization. Now, I, like everyone else, is constantly being asked as an economist, as a lawyer, as a technical person, what is decentralization? There are very different views. And Ivan has rightly pointed to the fact that we have a very elaborate uh, system of financial regulation on securities where we have no definition of securities. I think we will also not have a coherent global definition of DeFi or decentralization, but it is extremely important to have that discussion. 
because let's take it perhaps from another perspective, from an industrial perspective. If we are to define what a microprocessor, a microprocessor is, and we're looking into chips. Now, if you look into that really on the various layers, you have 60, 70, 80 elements that need to come together to produce your one microprocessor. And in some of these inputs, the Chinese have a monopoly, on the others, the American, on some of them, even the European. If you see that from a competition perspective, you get completely lost because you have dominance here, you have oligopolies there, you have all sorts of stuff here, which is extremely difficult to, to tackle. Also, as we've seen from the different layers from the infrastructure on DeFi, you will probably not, although I'm a huge fan of complete decentralization, find one completely decentralized application at all. I mean, even Bitcoin started from a centralized perspective and a certain moment, then people let loose and then it developed. It's the same discussion that we're having with smart contracts and other things. Now, what then is really decentralized? I think that decentralized is more a type of attitude that you have to see from a context that you have to see from the results that is being produced. But even the most decentralized thing that you can get in DeFi space, probably if there's a bridge, if there's a link to something else in an infrastructure on the layers, will also be attached to something that is more centralized. I think therefore, we have to define an agenda where we really see what can that meaningfully mean. And contrary, that's of course, again, my very personal opinion, as things we have seen in other contexts of financial, but also real economy regulation here, if we want it or not, we have a global discussion because indeed, as has been said before, DeFi, DAOs, that is by nature global, but it's not global in the sense that traditionally now all the top-down organizations, countries come together and agree on something, but it is basically creating a new space next or within, let's say, these existing things that can have a life of their own. I mean, a lot of countries are now experimenting to see how they can fill that with life. There are even the ideas of having diplomatic relationships between DAOs and countries and solving issues like taxation and other things. This is truly revolutionary. But this also, of course, means that, that certain phrases are not that easy as before, decentralized versus centralized and, and things like that. And this is actually where industry comes in, because, I mean, I'm speaking to Ivan, I'm speaking to many, many other people, probably the impression that, that I'm having is by now, if we talk Mika, if we talk transfer of funds, if we talk the pilot regime, whatever, take the European Parliament, very, very knowledgeable people, more than 700 of them, you can identify exactly 1%, meaning seven, that have more or less an idea of what we have been talking about in Mika or transfer of funds. If I was to discuss, and I'm doing that, uh, flash loans so or anything else, DeFi, with these people, there are zero people that understand, zero people that understand, which is why it is so much more important to actually present the use cases. We engage with industry on that. What is the concrete benefit of anything that we are doing here in terms of use for the citizens, for the small enterprises, for society as such? And this is the way that you can drive that discussion because my understanding, and please correct me, uh, colleagues, when, when I'm wrong, is that in, in very, very exceptional circumstances, if at all, is regulation coming without a context. The regulation is coming or other policy making is coming from a context that there are concrete problems for people that need to be addressed. The more you are able to put out the advantages, the concrete benefits of what you are doing in clear language to those people, the more time we have as policymakers and regulators to understand this area to develop meaningful rules in the long-term perspective and then to, to settle this. That's for me a little bit the challenge which makes this area here, DeFi, so much exceptional compared to other things that we've seen. I, I, if I can just jump in there, I think I completely agree um, uh, with what Joachim just said. I think because, you know, like the previous aspect um, was where I saw the challenges and maybe how do you sort of come in with regulation at what point but when you talk about the more specific or more broad depending on how you see it question of how you strike a balance between innovation and and sort of uh, regulatory compliance I think you have to understand the nature of of what you're dealing with right and and because there's just so many new aspects uh there are some things that might be known or fixed like as even as you know Joachim mentioned maybe the stack uh, which we have a, a maybe a good understanding of but then what are the other aspects that are evolving um you know like i think the idea is to to figure out sort of well, first of all, have a conversation with all in, all stakeholders, both public, private. And I think, again, that's, you know, in, in our work on DeFi, which has been very conversation driven, that's what we've been trying to do here at the AMF as well. But but that's like involving the participants from the DeFi ecosystem, um, both which might be quite advanced and technical, but also 
the ability to sort of translate that in into to sort of I think uh, sometimes the legislation at the EU level um, is is about translating that into uh, into you know common language or, or rules that could be understood. I think that's where the the focus of it's going to be. So I think those it's not so much a challenge, but that's going to be sort of how how a, an important tool as to how you balance out um, you know addressing the risks with the innovation that it brings. Yeah. Maybe if I can come in, I mean, <laughs> we agree too much here on this panel. It's not good. Uh, no, but I mean, that's incredibly, I agree, it's incredibly important uh, to kind of use the right language. And I think it's very helpful, at least in the, uh, in the, in the financial side of things, but obviously um, elsewhere as well, uh, to kind of use, you know, uh, comparisons to you know, what exists in the traditional uh, financial sector. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's doable. Um, you know, DeFi, for example, Kind of does, uh, you know, naturally or organically uh, something what open finance as well is trying to achieve. You know, this notion that you kind of open up data sets um, uh, between intermediaries. So, data sets about, you know, be personal client data or not personal data that can be shared then across intermediaries to the benefits of the consumers ultimately. Um, I think, you know, this notion that you have basically non custodial wallets um, and, you know, that you might have tokens that represent certain you know, life events that then you can, or your network or, uh, you know, whatever, or your assets that then you can um, uh, kind of, you know, move from one application to the other. I think it's a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful notion. And I think that's, that's something that policymakers can understand. This notion of open source economy as well, I mean, as a way of kind of more efficiently organizing, um, you know, innovation potential, if you will, rather than having um, you know, separate uh, kind of islands or companies uh, building the whole infrastructures, uh, you know, on their own. Um, but, you know, rather, you know, in this kind of open source economy, just, you know, picking up a very efficient solution and then integrating it with your application. I think it's, it's very powerful. Uh, we have other notions as well, you know, from the market infrastructure perspective, you know, the fact that permissionless blockchains are these kind of, you know, if you will, cross-border settlement layers. Uh, I mean, we've been grappling in, in Europe with kind of trying to achieve the capital markets union and um, and kind of unifying these fragmented, um, you know, liquidity pools of assets. You know, it's, it's a big thing. Um, I think, you know, to make the argument, well, you know, here's a cross-border settlement layer that then, you know, people can build upon. Um, again, you know, it unifies potentially the European market. I mean, it's, it's not as simple as that. And DeFi obviously, you know, has a lot of issues that need to be sorted out. But I think it's it's useful to kind of talk about it, at least in terms of these um, uh, familiar notions to the 700 people that are sitting in the parliament or, or elsewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, I would like to... Um maybe make a point here that uh, I think uh, I, I, I like the potential that we can have with Web3 in general, all the applications and not just uh, DeFi. And I think DeFi by itself uh, is definitely going to be integrated uh, with the DAO, with the, with the um, digital identity, decentralized identity. We need that as well you know, for, for all the, the verifications and the, 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 the compliance. I mean, how are we going to compliance with that, with the digital uh, identity and DAO and whatever else? And when we're thinking about, uh, Joachim just uh, was mentioning, um, what is the centralization exactly? Is it something that, because there's always going to be something, I mean, someone has to write the code. So that group of people are definitely some kind of centralized group because it starts from somewhere. I mean, any protocol that we have, even Ethereum started with, uh, a group of, I don't know, several developers who put together a protocol, that's how it starts. And then it, it, it you know, with the adoption of this the protocol, then it becomes maybe more decentralized. Uh, so there's, you know, it's it's like the, the definition, and I agree with you, Kim, it's very uh, murky in a sense. I mean, what is decentralized and when does it become to become decentralized? I mean, that's a question. And how can you explain that even to to uh, you know, a timeline that it's going to emerge to that eventually and when that is going to happen exactly and are you going to separate that and regulate it before and after. I mean, it's kind of, it's very, 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 very tricky. So we are in, in a new era of um, definitely a new technology. And I think 
think uh, everyone trying to rub their hand, their, their head around what it is and how to define it and what are the definition and how to use it and what are the benefits, what are the risks. So I think that we are the infancy of this technology. And this is why we, we are struggling to better understand and define it. And, and even and not just the regulators, but everyone, even the, the, the ones who are hands-on building it are, uh, are, are, are being challenged. Uh, but I do see a lot of benefits. I see, you know, like, like uh, when we're talking about like social impact, I mean, I think, yeah, we can really bring social impact to DeFi. DeFi has great potential with that. Uh, when talking about financial inclusion, equity, uh, economic equity, social equity, you know, around the world, I think uh, this is important to think about this. We are now talking about definitions instead of thinking about the big picture of the benefits. I mean, because if you see like the goal that what it what what it can really do, I think we can we'll be able to pass the hurdles. It's like you know you're running a marathon, so you know that I don't know in 20 miles from now you're going to finish it, and then you know you're going to drink the water and everything is going to be great, but you are struggling, you know, trying to figure. Yeah, I have to get there. So this is how we have to think about it. It's not, it's not a sprint. It's definitely a marathon and a long marathon. Uh, but we all have to understand that there is a benefit. There's a goal. There's something good that can come out of it and try to work through all the challenges and not say, oh, we, because of this, uh, it's not going to work. Or because of this, I mean, I mean, we have to be patient and lots of endurance. We, we, we need to have lots of endurance here for sure, because I think that the benefits are, are greater than, than, than the challenges. And, and, I think, uh, and I think even that the, another thing that I would like to, uh, in my mind, and maybe something that we should somehow uh, try to explain that and, and um, resonate that with the, with the regulators, that basically, in fact, uh, DeFi can, be, can provide more compliance, not less compliance, because it's very transparent. So you can, compliance can come in two ways. I call it on-chain and off-chain. On-chain meaning like within the code itself. I mean, smart contracts themselves can, can uh, write all the regulation because regulation is basically, uh, if you think about it, it's rule-based. Uh, whether someone, if something is compliant or not, whether you, you're going to uh, transfer this uh, uh, based on you know, several rules, whether you're going to transfer this uh, um, this funds or not, etc. So that can come with, can be within the smart codes. Of course, the smart codes has to be audited, and you know, I, I can talk about it later if, if you like. Uh, that's one. And then there's also the off chain, which in real time you can monitor everything that is happening because it's decentralized. That's happening in on the on the blockchain itself, on the all of this application, all the Web three applications, and everyone can see that, including the regulators, including everybody else. So from that perspective, they get more compliance, not less compliance. I mean, the SEC, I probably know that they, they have this rule for every exchange that they have to have market surveillance. What is market surveillance? I mean, it's kind of like the software that monitors, you know, what's happening on the exchange. Think about it, you know, taking it to the extreme with what can happen with, with decentralized finance is like all application, not just exchange. I mean, exchanges can be monitored, you know, like market surveillance, you know, in real time. I mean, it's 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 better for them than uh, worse for them in my mind. So yeah, that's something that I would like everyone to bear in mind. Just sorry, uh, you, know, you go, Ivan. I was just gonna bounce back maybe on one thing. That yeah, yeah, but do, do it, do it, and then I'll come in. Okay. No, I was. Thank you. I was literally uh, gonna bounce back maybe on sort of more on the. Um, you know, compliance uh, side of things as a regulator, you might say that's uh, what I'm concerned with as well. But it's also, I think, you know, DeFi beyond a lot of the new aspects it does, it's also, you know, some of the activities um, it, it proposes seem in some ways similar to what you see in TradFi. So I think the question with DeFi is that it does some of those things in a new way. That's how I see it. Uh, and, and, you know, whereas, again, you, you might look at sort of uh, uh, off-chain uh, crypto asset players, which, you know, will be regulated under Mika, uh, and that's sort of existing ways uh, of, of doing um, new things, maybe sort of, you know, crypto asset uh, exchange or trading, that kind of stuff. So I think, I think um, with that in mind, the idea with DeFi and the, maybe another difficult touch point as to how to balance out that, you know, sort of innovation versus addressing risk is how do you figure out 
you know, the that any existing activities under current legislation could be transposable uh, versus new activities or activities that are not captured under existing legislation and determining again that point in time when something can be developed. So I think it's that, you know, how do you apply the uh, same risk, same uh, activity, same rule kind of thing? So I think those are the questions that, you know, and that, those are quite fundamental questions, again, from a policy making or regulatory perspective. So just to bounce back more on the how do you, you know, balance out the compliance, I guess, with the innovation side of things? Sorry. No, I, I'm, no, no I, I mean, I wanted to add uh, also maybe as a follow up, I mean, with regards to this, what uh, what you mentioned about kind of embedded supervision, that this could be better for the regulators as well, because everything is kind of on chain and transparent. I mean, that that is true to an ex extent, but I, uh, we actually have now a tender um, you know, that will, so a contract that will soon start, uh, well, where we will have a contractor build us um, an application, which will precisely kind of test out, uh, okay, what is the kind of data that you can um, collect from, for example, Ethereum, and how does that compare to the kinds of data that regulators uh, collect from, you know, um, um, a regulated entity, a TradFi entity that is providing an analogous service. Um, and I think, you know, that will you know, put to the test this idea at least to an extent. But I mean, it's it's already kind of clear. Well, you don't know who's transacting, and that seems kind of like a very crucial element to know uh, if you want to supervise uh, market uh, manipulation or you know insider dealing. Uh, anyone can create a wallet and have you know seven wallets and um, uh, transact uh, completely anonymously. And you're not going to know that it's the same person potentially manipulating the market. You know, obviously there might be some really, really, really fancy software that can do that. And I think you know you have these uh, private analytics companies that that definitely do good on-chain analysis, but mm -hmm. it's it's definitely not that straightforward. Um, and I think it will be a big learning curve cur for the regulators as well to kind of develop the right skill so sets that they can do it, because if you don't have a centralized entity that is basically you know, um, supervising its order book or, or whatever, but rather it's some kind of a protocol that's not regulated. Well, then you know, it's up to the regulator alone to kind of figure out whether something is happening. Whereas in this traditional space, there is an obligation for the exchange to basically supervise its own market. Um, so you have that kind of additional layer of, of supervision, both from the regulator and the, the, the trading venue itself. So you know, just to say that you know, there are challenges and that you know, there, there will be put to the test. Uh, yeah, Ivan, mean, you're absolutely correct, you know, that uh, just, you know, looking and watching, you know, the transactions probably will not be enough. And you definitely have to need to add to that the layer of all kinds of AI and other algorithm that to figure out, you know, all this uh, relationship that I call them. Um, being, you know, someone who's also a data scientist, so I understand what you mean by that. So it's definitely not just a, a plan, um, vision on, on what the transactions are, but also doing all kinds of other analytics. That's what I mean by off-chain, uh, uh, that it's kind of like a, uh, create like some kind of an analytical AI type of a, a software that will provide all the services. And I think it's possible. It's definitely possible. We all know what AI is doing these days. So it is possible. So just that's a thought. Thank you, thank you all. Because we're running out of time, I will just dump a few questions to, to see if we manage to get on time and then we can come back. So um, one question for all of you, what are your perspectives on the liability of developers and DAOs in the DeFi ecosystem? And how can we strike a balance between accountability for code vulnerabilities or smart contract failures while also encouraging innovation and avoiding stifling creativity? <laughs> That's probably one of the most difficult questions for this uh, panel, uh, but I think it's a really good one. If I, if you don't mind, I can maybe have a, a first stab at it, yes. and then obviously happy to, to to open up. But I think like you might need to look at that, those aspects from two angles. I think there's again both the technical level, and then there's the organizational, or human, or governance level. And I think on the technical level, the fact that DeFi seems to be by nature so multi-layered, you know, adds some level of complexity to the liability question because 
you have the transaction journey on the one hand, you know, which goes from the application interface all the way to the, the lower levels of the blockchain for settlement uh, and, and recording. And then you have the developer journey, which is the other way, basically, which goes from, um, you know, initially the, the layer ones, layer two blockchains and the protocols, uh, the, the smart contracts, et cetera, were, were developed. Um, and so that journey, though, is in, in, inexorably intertwined. So, you know, despite the fact that it is automated and autonomous um, in, in principle or in theory, it does still benefit users, right? And, and, and uh, the users that use those protocols at the end of the day. So how do you capture that responsibility that comes with that, you know, potential crystallization of risk? I think this is where you have to start looking at the different levels across that stack. And I think potentially some areas you could look at are, and, you know, this is sort of what, again, what we've gathered in terms of discussions uh, we've had with, with players and participants, but you might look at the application level, so the access that is provided, but also, and this is maybe a view sort of we've, we've developed, but also the smart contract level, because that's where the codified rules, right, uh, seem at least to dictate the activity. I think obviously still open for discussion, but I think in terms of capturing the, the liability, um, that's sort of where you might want to look at. And then there's also the governance level. So in terms of the involvement of the users or participants in the DAO. Uh, so again, more on the human side of things. And the question there is how do you capture the responsibility for something, an organization which could exist potentially in a very loose manner um, across the internet. And then you know identity and transparency being key factors uh, for regulators. And therefore, how do you tackle the problem of pseudonymity as well as potential like uncertainty around uh, legal uh, or you know jurisdictional uncertainty? I think even though I'm not giving answers, I think those are definitely the aspects that, that might need to be focused on. Um, and then maybe on the second part is how do you strike a balance um, between accountability and, and failures? I think, again, like you probably have like a discussion with all um, players and stakeholders here and i think again you sort of when you develop uh, your view as to how best implement or develop regulatory like rules or requirements is to find that point where you can reach something that will strike balance uh, and obviously the concern being that you have to ensure that the basic principles like again i mentioned earlier but same risk same activity uh, etc are, are upheld so i think again maybe not giving an answer but pass to answers hopefully if that if that uh, helps I think that helps quite a lot. And perhaps to add very briefly on that, I mean, um, bank robbers prefer BMWs and Audis because they are fast cars and you can get quickly away with that. That doesn't mean that the car manufacturers have never heard that are being held responsible for bank robberies. I think the programmers are, for me personally, in, in a quite similar situation. I mean, this is really collective responsibility. And we have historically a long history over thousands of years of cooperatives of collective responsibility where we have blueprints for that, that we now, finally, that you have the technology to scale can put in a digital domain. Add that on top of what has been said before, that actually here we have a lot of transparency. We have AI coming in, we have companies like Chanalysis and many others that are very advanced in tracking patterns, looking at the metadata, etc. So there is a big role already for better compliance in, in the sector than in comparable things. If you combine that with the third element of the risk that has so far been, I would say, rather low-key compared to other things, at least that is what I think our approach has been. Uh, there is an uphill battle for everyone to come into this space to really hold those people that provide the fundamental services uh, responsible. The more so as the technology as such being decentralized, we've been discussing that uh, before in a way, of course, has a centralized element, but then it lets loose. I think the key issue for me is also to make a new assessment of what can realistically expected from a public sector. Given that people are coming here normally voluntarily, the entry points will become much more important to have very clear information also on the contracts. We see it now that AI is reading smart contracts as being much faster than anything before to point at problems in uh, smart contracts that can be made very transparent. So I think actually there is a lot of opportunity already for having a sort of guidance towards good solutions built into the system. And that provides, again, the opportunity for, I would say, a thorough assessment without jumping to conclusions. But um, again, just my opinion, but I think completely key to what Olivier said. And we have the technology that already provides a lot of answers. Um, yeah, if I may uh, chime in, um, 
again, you know, in line with whatever Hakim is saying and uh, Olivia. Uh, yeah, I mean, but I will, uh, I agree with, with whatever was said here, but I would like to mention something that we have to differentiate between regulating and the developers or, or the, the, the code, the, the ones who are the programmers and find them accountable for the code. So these are two different things completely in my mind. Yes, we should. They should be accountable for whatever they, the code that they they are writing. Definitely, because you know they. This is your job. This is your profession. I mean, every profession, in every profession, you find people that they have to be accountable for the work that they do. So definitely, this is important. As to regulate them, that's a different story. I'm not sure whether we should regulate them. Should we find them accountable? Yes, and there are ways to do that without putting this, you know, under some regulation umbrella. Uh, we can do that through certification of smart contracts. We can do that through auditing, and auditing could be even an open source. It could be auditing of uh, some kind of a DAO that will audit, uh, you know, the smart contracts in a way that you know bring the community to audit that. And before it is audited and getting like a you know like a check mark, then only then you can launch it. You can't just you know launch it, you know, just because you, you just, you know, wrote something and you really want to share it with the world, uh, even if it might have bugs and loopholes. I'm not saying that people are doing things malicious, maliciously. Sometimes it's just, you know, a bug. So it's just a loophole. And that loophole, you know, people take advantage and suddenly, you know, they, I don't know, um, a million dollars are, 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 are lost and stolen. So we have to be very mindful about, about that. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, yes, we have to, you know, I, I said that, you know, that whenever, you know, these de developers you know, are writing the code and I know that they're very excited and they really want to share it with the world. Before that, we have audited, we have to have some kind of a, a, a figure out, you know, whether it's a system, whether AI will do that, you know, some kind of a preliminary uh, review and then, uh, we can take it out, you know, to some kind of a DAO that will a community that will audit that, and then it will be certified. And only after it is certified, then it can be launched. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, even after it is launched, there will be some kind of monitoring, ongoing monitoring to figure, to make sure that there is nothing, you know, wrong uh, happening, uh, you know, as it is being launched. Uh, that's uh, my view on that. Yes, they should be accountable. Yes, they should be mindful of what they're putting out there. Regulating is not, I'm not so, uh, you know, thrilled about regulating the developers because that will, in, in my mind, might stifle in, innovation because after we do want to uh, have the creative mind and the enthusiasm in developing, uh, find them accountable because it should be, but regulating them I think it's a little bit more sensitive. So that's my view. Um, I don't know. That is a difficult question, which I, I mean, I don't know. I haven't figured out that out internally at all. But it does feel like uh, a corporate law has kind of provided a solution you know, of limited liability, uh, which works pretty good. Uh, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, how do we deal with DAOs? Um, I mean, uh, I suppose, you know, we've seen, um, I think it was, yeah, the SEC in the States, you know, went against a DAO and they hold, held anyone, everyone kind of individually liable, basically everyone who, I don't know, maybe made use of their governance token and voted or some kind of a proposal. I mean, that's clearly a suboptimal outcome for that DAO. Um, so it feels like it would be better if they would incorporate. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand that this kind of dispersed community of people probably doesn't want to set up a company in Germany or something. Uh, but yeah, but, you know, that, that's kind of like the ongoing considerations that regulators need to uh, in, engage in. Um, but I mean, we also can't, you know, adapt. I don't know. To me, it seems like, you know, it, it can't be the case that the market now expects um, you know, policymakers and regulators to kind of, you know, throw out uh, the whole rule book and just write a completely new one that works for, uh, you know, every idiosyncrasy of DeFi. Um, I, I don't think that's going to work. Um, and then, I mean, in terms of regulating uh, developers, I, I, I don't know what to think about. I mean, it really depends on what, what kind of approach ultimately you take. It, it feels in, in, instinctively to me that 
you know, th there should be some kind of a proportional balancing act in the sense that, well, I mean, like not everyone who writes some kind of a contract, which is effectively a regulated activity, like via Mika or Mifid uh, or whatever, which is used by, you know, two persons in the world, all of a sudden should, um, you know, be enforced against. Uh, but then, I mean, then you get into the iffy kind of territory of, okay, but where do you draw the line then? So how, like, does it, is, is it the case then when that uh, protocol maybe achieves a certain scale that then at that point, you know, there should be some kind of certificate, you know, very strong kind of certification requirements um, because obviously there are investor protection concerns, you know, if it's super widely used protocol, I mean, there could be even, you know, market integrity, financial stability concerns. We're definitely far away from that. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's legitimate to then ask for, um, you know, certain safeguards that, um, you know, even a developer could be held um, accountable for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we might need to move to questions from the audience. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Let me check in the Q&A. I see a question here. What are your views on the benefits of financial stability, innovation, et cetera, of fi uh, financial products and services totally independent from trade fi? Uh, should regulators actively develop bespoke standards and avoid confusion, contagion? I don't know if anyone would like to take this. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it feels like, because when the person mentioned this, uh, you know, innovative product, I, I don't know why the notion of yield farming, you know, came to mind. And that's, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's a super productive, you know, very innovative kind of thing, uh, especially if you're kind of rehypothecating the same asset, you know, across like six protocols. And, you know, obviously we don't want to build a financial system that works like that. I mean, there were huge blowups in the, there were enough huge blowups in the traditional finance with, you know, leverage and and, and kind of obscure, exposures between uh, parties in the system that that we know that that's definitely not a path that should in any way be encouraged so i, th I think that kind of innovation uh you know sucks uh but uh you, you know this, this still it's kind of linked that thing is linked to the notion that you can kind of automate chains of transactions and that obviously you know can be sometimes a very powerful thing um you know with things like uh you know arbitrage even where you just kind of create more efficient markets um, if you can arbitrage away, you know, price differentials across um, across exchanges, but also, you know, create some kind of interesting maybe um, asset management services with these things. Uh, but I, I think there should be then more kind of real economy uh, tokens that represent uh, kind of investments in real economy. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of, I think we all agree there's a lot of kind of worthless tokens out there that's, you know, and it's rife with wash trading the whole ecosystem and everything. So, um, you know, th they're definitely interesting innovations, but they're definitely those that uh, we should kind of actively seek to minimize. Uh, maybe you. just on that question, I don't know, Tonya, do we have the time or? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Thank you. Uh, just, I, it's difficult to say in terms of what what is meant by maybe um, financial products or services totally independent independent from TradFi because that could be either in content if there's new forms of products uh, or, or really in form because even if you consider like you know flash loans or something really a loan is something that has existed you know ever since well finance finance was developed so it's more though the question of how that happens in my opinion in in DeFi, right i think one area we've looked at at the amf is is um maybe stuff like you know dexes so decentralized exchanges or amm so automated market makers which basically uh, again in my view like a, a different sort of model for that um and i think the new aspects on that are really sort of um you know the price formation process or risks of reliance on oracle so maybe not on the benefit side so much unfortunately more on the risk side but i think in terms of not again bespoke standards but because those models in some cases seem to be doing a, you know what i said earlier like activities which exist already but in a new way i think that should be definitely something to should be considered because there is something new here 
So I think I think again, maybe not so much on the benefit side, unfortunately, even though there are benefits. Again, more openness, the participation, etc. Um, I think you know, again, from the regulatory risk side, there's definitely new things that should be looked at. Yeah. Uh, if I may chime in quickly, um, I mean, we, I, mean, I think we should think even bigger, even beyond just financial services and loans and uh, borrowing and lending and and earning a, an interest. I, I think we should think about, you know, because DeFi can basically, we're talking about the digital economy. I'm talking about digital economy, everything is going to be digitized and everything is going to be connected somehow through the internet, everything, everything that we do uh, today. And therefore I would like to take it even to the next level that DeFi, it, it could be in everything, it could be in everything that we do and it can increase and enhance our uh, reward system, our immersive experience. Just think about, just I'm throwing it out there. I think probably people are already thinking about that. Uh, we, we think about, you know, embedded finance. What is embedded finance? Embedded finance, you know, now, you know, it's, it's a, you go to a website, it's Amazon, you buy something and then they allow, they ask, they saying, okay, you can uh, buy that, you know, in installments or something like that. So that's kind of an embedded finance that we know today, but we can take it even to a, to, larger than bigger than that because of DeFi, because of the digital economy and the decentralizations and the connections you know with all with everything. Think about your equipment, your gym equipment. I don't know if you have a gym equipment at home. Maybe you do, maybe you not. So let's say you, you do. And you are working out and you know uh, and, and you reach a goal and you reach a goal and then you know this this machine now uh, through AI, whatever else you know uh, can can reward you with some tokens. And now these tokens, you're gonna to receive them just because you you are connected. And then this machine is connected to some decentralized uh, application that can take these rewards and now invest them in something, or maybe even go and buy your coffee. Uh, so just think about it in a broader way of how that can be utilized in our digital economy. That could be everything. That's what DeFi in my mind. That's you know the, the it can be like you know just boundless and and uh, limitless opportunities. Thank you. I see uh, another question from the audience. Um, it mentions just to be one step ahead of the curve. Uh, any considerations about decentralized applications developed by AI? It's still not widespread, but it's definitely doable even by ChatGPT. Uh, well, we already know that the judge, sorry, the judge is uh, I don't know, I don't know to what sophistication, you know, can write codes. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether it's sophisticated codes, but definitely not at least the very uh, basic ones it can do. Uh, whether AI eventually will replace a, a programmer, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, it's hard to say uh, today. Uh, I, I can't see you not know, all the, uh, in, uh, you know, the sophistication, I mean, depending how sophisticated it is, is a smart contract. I mean, uh, if it's a basic one, then probably yes. If it's much more than that, then probably not, not now. Maybe, I don't know, in the future. But uh, yes, I have seen that, you know, that they are AI that uh, can definitely write some codes. Thank you. And another one. Uh, my concern is that this technology is evolving exponentially, way faster than which regulators will ever be able to keep up. So this is just an observation. I assume I don't know if you would like uh, to respond to that, uh, if there's a need to, to keep up, yeah, please. No, I mean, I, I think regulators are used to kind of lagging behind market development. So this is, you know, nothing new for us. Uh, I mean, arguably, yes. I mean, this has been developing super fast and, and has forced us. I, I think it will, in a way, force us to kind of iterate our legislation more frequently, which is, you know, the, the thing that I think all lawyers are kind of uncomfortable with. Well, if we enshrine a certain set of rules, we want to, uh, you know, ensure there's legal certainty out there for a while. So it's, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, yeah. It's a challenge, but um, completely agree. But I also see it implemented already in the curricula. I mean, I, for example, regularly give lectures to uh, new regulators that are entering the markets from perspective of the token economy and Web3, et cetera. 
and they all realized that I think this is a different ball game. Yes, um, people have been used to that, but compare the situation 20, 30 years ago, also when I started, you had years ahead where you had mature markets, a limited number of incumbents that you knew and you could deal with that. That will never come back, in my opinion, and I'm an economic historian. I've seen a lot on innovation and, and growth over the last uh, centuries. This is a specific technology in the sense of speed, but it's not hopeless as we have been discussing for regulators. Uh, if you have sound principles, if you have that inclusive approach also with the market, if you can agree on, let's say, certain limits and also try to activate people in the space that they are better educated, that they are again more used to taking responsibilities, there are solutions to that. I mean, we should not forget that, and that again is my personal opinion, the last 200, 250 years of financial markets and banking are an irregularity in the long-term history of how we are doing business in the world. Because first of all, when the world got more complex, the intermediaries came to help people, and then they started to get a life on their own, now governing our money and taking decisions away from us. And what that technology forces us is to take our decisions again ourselves. That is a painful exercise for many people. That is a concern for people that are risk adverse. That's also an issue for everyone, including the regulators. But that is basically the task ahead. And we are struggling with that. But for example, my son or the generation that is coming up already has a much more, I would say, convenient approach to that because they grow up with that. So in the long term, I'm not really concerned. I think also in the short and medium term, regulators have a very good idea actually on how to deal these things. But indeed, as we have all said, leaning back and basically saying, yeah, there should be some regulation coming up, but um, I go on holidays before and then I build a house and then later I take a look at this, then you have five generations of the market that's not working. Uh, just, you know, a quick, uh, um, quick, quick view on this. I mean, I I mean, yes, you know, usually regulators, you know, I, I, I like to late to the game, so to speak. How late could be a day, it could be a year, it could be 10 years. Uh, but but that doesn't give a license to innovators, you know, to do whatever they want and just and, to, and wait for regulars to come and police them. I think that the innovators and the ecosystem has to be mindful, mindful of what they build, responsible, what I call, you know, uh, innovate responsibly. That's how I think that we should have this attitude of innovate responsibly. Think about what you do. If you can't, if the regulars are not coming in yet, then self-regulate, I don't know, through all kinds of association and organizations, you know, and think and build, you know, certification for how to do a smart contract and how to develop and how to build a protocol. I, th I don't, you know, I think that it's up to the people to have a responsibility of how, it, how the product and services are going to be used and if they might be harmful. I mean, if, it, that's, as I think, something that every innovator and any company can ask, say, oh, it's, I'm not regular, so I can do whatever I want. No, I don't think this should be the attitude. I should be, I should take responsibility. I should be accountable. And I think it has to come, you know, even before regulators uh, are, are into the game. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we are about to run out of time, so I would like to thank you all very much for this insightful discussion. Uh, we had a few more questions that we'd like to go through, but we didn't have the time. Still, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Marina for the final remarks before we close. So Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Thank you uh, to all the guests and thank you, Tonya. Uh, so we are very happy you did accept our invitation and thank you so much for bringing so many interesting topics uh, and answers to, to our audience today. Thank you everyone for joining this panel uh, and joining this webinar um, and especially for your questions. As of for um, us in the name of um, European Crypto Initiative, IOTA, and of course, European Blockchain Association, Mariana and Erwin, we uh, are very happy and really hope for uh, us to have a dialogue in the future, very similar to what happened with Mika, to continue with these dialogues also when it comes to the DeFi regulation. Um, and of course, going back to what was said today about you know, um, the percentage of the mem people in the, in the parliament MPs knowing in detail about this technology. I think 
there's still, of course, a lot of work to do, especially from our side to provide, you know, as objective and understandable information from the industry. Uh, and we are aware that there is a social cost to adapting to new regulations and to new innovations. But at the same time, we hope that this social cost will, need, will not limit uh, the innovations that this technology can bring. Uh, because if we do limit it very early, it, was, it will be very hard for us to understand all the use cases that this technology can also help and bring uh, in Innovate. So thank you again, everyone for coming. And we really hope that we'll have more discussions like this in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. All the best. Take care. Bye. Cheers.